Hey, this is Cindy Black and Santana, and you're listening to Jim on Bass. Welcome back to another episode of the Jim on Bass Show. For today's very special guest, I have one of my favorite drummers ever. So very excited to have her on. She played with one of my favorite musicians and band arrangements with Lenny Kravitz. Uh, she's currently the drummer for Santana. Please welcome the queen of drums, the great Cindy Blackman Santana. Thanks for coming on, Cindy. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And you're over in Maui right now, right? Uh, Kauai. Close. Oh, Kauai. Yeah. Is that kind of your home away from home or? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. It's the rejuvenation spot. <laughs> <laughs> So I know you're in between like Vegas residencies too, right? Is that where you guys live most of the time? Or is that where you kind of rejuvenate and get ready for the next leg? We rejuvenate here. We live in Las Vegas. So. Oh, okay, yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was wondering when you're there, what do you do? Like, are you guys surfers at all? Could we see on the beach walking around or hiking? Like, what do you do for fun over there? You can, you can definitely see us on the beach. You can, I haven't learned <laughs> to surf yet, but that's one of my, goals that I plan to do this this year before the end of the year I want to take some surfing lessons uh, not this trip but probably the next trip uh, okay. I'll start some surfing <laughs> lessons um, I do hike around um, so you know beaches hiking hanging out at like some of the beautiful vortex spots here mm. um, and just enjoying the, the the nature you know I love to go to the farmers markets and get mm. like all the freshly picked food and fruit and stuff so yeah all that kind of stuff. Yeah, when I heard you're in Hawaii, it made me think about like food and stuff. So are you guys good cooks? Like, uh, do you have a special meal you like to throw down or? Um, you know, I like to cook, but I do a lot of blending. Okay. Because of the way that I eat just for mm -hmm. my diet. So I eat a lot of raw food. So I, I blend a lot, you know, I blend okay. a lot of vegetables, blend a lot of fruits. Um, but yeah, I, I do like to cook. Um, and I like to make things. I, I love to make beautiful salads. I love to mm. make, um, you know, some raw dishes. Um, I haven't always eaten this way. So I do know okay. how to, you know, make fried chicken and sweet potatoes <laughs> and, and, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff, mm. you know, um, mushroom sauces and, you know, and different things. Um, but I try to stay on the on the healthier side. And, and we also have a great lady, um, Jennifer Pedro, who helps us, and she's she's a much better chef than I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we have her her beautiful help, and she, you know, everything is presented in such a beautiful way. It's so pretty. <laughs> we we always end up taking pictures of the meal before yeah. we can even take a bite. You know, so we we have her help, and and then you know I do my thing as well in between. Awesome. Well, is there a recording studio too in the house? Or I imagine if you get creative over there, you gotta be able to you know, capture it. Right. And you got the drums right no, behind you. <laughs> I have the drums right here and I have, um, we don't have a, a, like a little studio set up. We, we, we moved. Um, and in the other house, we had a whole studio set up in the garage. Like our garage oh, okay. was, you know, we made a room within the room in, of that garage and that was the studio. Uh, here we don't, we don't have a bona fide studio as of yet, but you know, I do have all my recording gear. I have all my stuff set up over there. I have all my mics and stuff and, mm. you know, Put away of course i don't keep them out every day but you know when i want to record something you know i just take everything out and set it up in here and, it's really, oh, okay. and it actually sounds pretty good it's yeah not too bad yeah i was i've heard other musicians like just the way technology is now i guess you can kind of capture it anywhere right because i know you can uh, if you especially if you have a good room you know mm -hmm. um you can pretty and and i mean you know good enough room that you don't have to like tweak every little thing about your instrument <laughs> You know, yeah. because there's always a lot of stuff that you can do, especially if you play um, an instrument that just plugs in directly, like mm. a keyboard or a guitar or something like that, or, you know, bass. Um, those are, you know, you can go direct and really affect the sound. You know, when you're talking about something that's recorded completely acoustically, of course, you can tweak the sound as well. But mm -hmm. it's always better to start out with um, a good organic sound to work with. Gotcha. Well, it kind of reminds me too of uh, Lenny Kravitz because I know he has a getaway in the in the Bahamas, right, where he records. So I'm sure you've been there uh, yeah. many times. <laughs> I've been to his Bahamas uh, home, um, and um, at least the one that he had when when I was around. I think he still has the same one. I think it's just uh, probably changed a bit, maybe bigger or something. I don't mm. really remember. <laughs> but yeah, it was it's awesome. His his 
area there is so pretty. It's just, yeah, it's it's another heavenly spot yeah. on this earth that we have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're on my podcast, so I'm curious, do you listen to other podcasts? Like, what else do you like to listen to that's maybe non-music related? I don't listen to a lot of podcasts, actually. <laughs> Me either, though. That's a funny thing. <laughs> I, yeah, I've, I've been on some, and I even started one with a friend of mine, um, and and we have some interviews down. Uh. Uh, we haven't released them as of yet because we wanted to build like a, a nice little library of things before we started putting yeah. stuff out. But I I'm not really one to go listen to a podcast. I barely watch TV. You know, I, I listen to music. I like to meditate. I love to read books, and you know, there's a lot of spiritual study that I do. Um, so I frankly just don't even really have that much time to watch TV. So, you know, or watch podcasts, you know, so, but, but, but from time to time I do, and, and, and somebody's asked me to, to do a Ted talk. Mm -hmm. So I've started to like, just study some different Ted talks to see how people present their ideas and, yeah. you know, kind of look at the format and see the timelines and how much time you have to really, you know, um, share ideas to see how you can best present it so that, you know, mm -hmm. it comes off well. Uh, in in the given time um but other than that i yeah i don't really have a lot of time to or don't really take a lot of time to 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 watch a lot of a lot of that stuff <laughs> would you have a, a name for the podcast yet or um we've been toying around with a couple of names and the okay. first name that we we like the best um is taken so we mm. had to change it and i won't disclose that name as of yet but um the one that we've chosen um but yeah hopefully you know by the end of the year we'll have some other interviews on tap and then we can start maybe even by the first of the year just releasing these different podcasts we did a an incredible interview with um sophia stewart are you familiar with sophia no. mm -hmm. she's the woman who and you might want to check her out for your okay. podcast too she's very interesting <laughs> okay. um, she's not a musician um but she does love and appreciate the arts and she mm. is a writer Ah, okay. So she's definitely creative and she is the original writer of the matrix and the terminator oh sweet <laughs> so her works were absconded we won't don't have to get into that but she's the original writer and and she's just incredibly brilliant so it's really fun to talk to her so we did a great interview with, with, with her that was really really um enlightening shall i say we did another one with a scientist um who's actually a, a, a friend of mine um her and her, her and uh my my I have a friend who's her son. He's a, a piano player, so we mm. know each other like from studying Kabbalah and from playing music together. Um, and she and her team developed um, something called Tolovid, which is a um, supplement to boost the immune system and and um, really stop COVID from spreading in in your body. You know. Oh wow. Um, yeah, it's 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 really cool. Um, so that was also, so we have a few, you know, uh, yeah. interviews that are really, um, not only fun, but really informative. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, well, that'll be fun. I'll keep my eye out for that. That'll be some, uh, good discussions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, do you guys have any pets too? Uh, are, you, are you a dog person or anything like that? Or I like pets, but, but we don't have any, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, me, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of, um, I, I, like I said, I love pets, but I'm really kind of like a germaphobe, so I really don't want <laughs> hair all over my couches and oh, yeah. you know, stuff like that. <laughs> um, so I just kind of love them from afar. You mm. know, I love pets from afar, and uh, we, we don't have any pets. And plus, you know, we're gone so much of the time yeah. that it's difficult. I tried to have a cat once. Uh, this is when I was <laughs> um, living in New York, mm. and it just didn't work out when I started touring a lot. You know, I eventually had to give her to my mom. Mm. You know, um, <laughs> because I just couldn't I couldn't be there to to to, to care for her, you yeah. know, and I couldn't get people who I, who were dependable enough to come in and take care of her, you know, so, um, yeah, it's kind of if you're so busy, it doesn't doesn't really yeah. work because the, the animals, you know, they deserve and need a lot of love. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if you can't give it to them properly, then I don't think it's fair for you to just keep them cooped up in the house. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and then you know it stresses the owner out too when you feel like you're gone a lot so yeah that's a good move then yeah 
One thing that I love about uh, you and your husband, Carlos Santana, too, is being from the Bay Area, I have some great memories of you guys playing uh, the national anthems for the Warriors finals games. So I was wondering, are you guys big Warriors fans? Or Because I never thought you could play the national anthem so many different ways. And then you guys show up and just have multiple. <laughs> you just did the Raiders somewhat recently. So I love seeing when you guys do that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we, we are we are um, big uh, Warriors fans. Oh, cool. Um, and like, I mean, Steph Curry, how can you not be a fan of his? So he's <laughs> yeah, like, true. Know, one of the greatest uh, uh, people who have ever graced any genre. You know, yeah. I mean, his level of proficiency is so high that, you know, it just garners its own respect. And he's kind of in his own lane right now, yeah. you know, which is amazing. And, and um, um, Reggie Miller did an interview with him and, and he said, <laughs> Steph, do you realize that the person who can break your record hasn't been born yet? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Steph Curry, we are big, huge fans of the Warriors and, and huge Steph Curry fans. And we're Raiders fans. Okay. And we did just do a Raiders um, uh, uh, event and we, we played the national anthem, Carlos and I. And those are always a blast. And it's so much fun to try to come up with a different way to, to approach this mm -hmm. song that everybody here knows so well, yeah. you know, but yet make it palatable. Um, you know, we like to make it have a, a nice groove so that people can get into it in a different way than just, you know, the sedentary way that it's sung a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so we, we, we enjoy doing different things with it. And, and, you know, there are some examples historically of some people who did great renditions of it of course the famous Jimi hendrix one yeah you know um the marvin gay version mm -hmm. the whitney houston version those are like three of my favorite ver versions um and so you know we, we we take a tip from from the level that they brought to to that song and and, and we just go different places with it so yeah it's, it's a whole lot of fun yeah <laughs> well, you mentioned uh, we talked about the Warriors. Uh, it was cool for me over the summer. I got to have Steph Curry on for a, about a minute, and then I had Andre Iguodala on. So it was kind of cool to have them on. Big Warriors fan. Uh, the one thing that I thought was interesting is when you guys do those renditions, you're on the court, but then for the I saw the coverage from the Raiders, and you're up high. So it was kind of a different uh, vantage point. It looked like oh, a whole different vantage point. I mean, it was. You know, and I said to one of the one of the gentlemen who was kind of one of the guards who was who was helping us and, and helping us get to and from um, around the around the arena, and it was a different energy. You know, mm. the energy there's a different energy in football than there is in basketball. Mm. You know, and both energies are are great and high, but you know, the the, the basketball energy has a lot of power. And of course, a lot of this and the football energy has a lot of this, but it's kind of more, energy, yeah. you know, it's macho. -ness. It's a different thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really interesting. So it was interesting to feel that um, and then to be at the vantage point where you're looking at the stadium and looking down mm. like that as we were, <laughs> it just gives you a whole nother perspective because I mean, there are 65,000 people in there, you know. Yeah. And so it's, it's a whole different thing. Um, you're a little bit further away from feeling it. Um, so, for instance, when you're down on the court, you know, you're really feeling it. It's yeah. like <laughs> the difference of playing like, you know, up close and personal to people where they're really feeling it and you're really feeling them as opposed to playing in a big, huge arena, you know, where you're further away and it's still incredible, but it's mm -hmm. just a different, different perspective. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking it might not even seem real because because you are so high and they're so small in a way. Um, but uh, yeah, I thought that was in a way, a pretty, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It was a cool clip to see, though, and trying to get into like the early, the early years. So you're born in Ohio. Did you live there a lot of your life or? Born in Ohio in Yellow Springs, Ohio, and we left there um, when I was 11. My father mm. got a job transfer, and so we went to Connecticut. OK, um, and um, from Connecticut, I stayed there all through high school in different few different cities because we moved around a little bit. Um, and then I went to uh, Boston and I went mm. to Berklee College of Music in Boston. Okay. And from there, um, I didn't stay that long. I think I was there for like three semesters. Um, and then I moved to New York. Oh, okay. And that is where a whole nother level of school began. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, when you were growing up, did you have any brothers or sisters? Or are you the only child? No, I, ha I have um, 
an older sister, and then okay. a, a, next is a brother, then myself, and then a younger sister. So there are four of us, and uh, we have um, four first cousins. So my uncle, my mm. dad's brother, had four as well, and we're okay. all similar in age. Mm. It's interesting, you know. So there was one that's kind of a couple months apart from me, and he was like my best friend. You know, mm. my, there's one who's kind of my sister's age, and there's one who's my brother's age, and there's one who's my older sister's age. You know, so it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. We each had like a, a a person who was kind of close to us in age. <laughs> yeah, per perfect match. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what did your parents do for work? My dad um, was an engineer, mm. and um, he loved music, so he had a lot of records around, and I used to raid his record collection <laughs> and listen to what was going on, and. Um, my mom and, and a lot of people on her side were musicians. You know, my mom played violin. And um, though she doesn't currently play, that is her instrument. You know, she's okay. definitely a violinist. You can tell from her demeanor. She's so soft spoken and she's just <laughs> very lyrical the way she speaks. You know, she's a violinist for sure. <laughs> okay. And her mom, my, my grandmother, um, was a classical pianist. Mm. And uh, she did that professionally. And my, my dad's mom played piano too. Uh, not professionally though. She played like in a church and you know she could sight she could sight read. You know, she could sing her hymns and play along and accompany herself and, you know, involved in the choir and stuff like that. And my my mom's mom played in the church as well. She played the big pipe organ. Mm. <laughs> and she was like four ten, you know, four feet ten inches tall, playing this big organ that was like <laughs> big pipe organ. It's like six. So when you see her, she's like this little minuscule person with, you know, doing all this was yeah. so powerful. She was just such an amazing being, you know? Mm. So my parents did that. And, and um, there were some other musicians in my family. My, my dad's brother sang and played acoustic guitar and vibraphone. Oh, okay. um, and then my sister sang and some cousins, various cousins. And my younger sister picked up vocals and piano and guitar as well. Oh, nice. Well, what was your first uh, concert that you got to go to? Oh, my very first concert was <laughs> um the very first time i saw music what live was local was a local mm. band in in yellow springs where i was from um the very first large concert that i went to was the average white band and wild cherry <laughs> okay and where was that in town or nearby it was nearby it was, okay. in yellow, it was in ohio i was living in yellow springs and i think it was in dayton or cincinnati oh, something okay like that and I was so young, I don't remember exactly where it was, but that was one of my first concerts ever. Oh, okay. That I, that I saw as a, as a child. I think I was, I was about ten. Okay. <laughs> did it have like a big effect on you? Like, wow, I, I want to do that, or did you just have a good time? Did it really? Did the bug get you yet? The music bug, or? The bug was already there. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> which is why I wanted to go and see people playing uh, live. You know, so I, I definitely wanted to play music. And I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know anything about touring. I didn't know anything about, you know, <laughs> anything really. I just knew that I wanted to play the drums, you know, mm. and I heard about this concert and I was like, can I go, can I go, please, can you take me? You know, so I, a lot of begging, of course, but uh, they took me and, and I got to see that concert. And it was really cool because, um, you know, the, the bands were nice and funky and I, I just observed mm. the people and how they were really, you know, getting into the, the vibe of it. And um, yeah. It was already germinating within me that that was something that I wanted to do, mm. you know, and so from there, it just kind of snowballed. Yeah. <laughs> my first concert was a cheap trick in uh, two, <laughs> in 2000. My dad took me They're They're still kind of old, but uh, they were good. So <laughs> so by default, they're kind of one of my favorites. I, I love their stuff, but I always like to see mm -hmm. who's people's first show. I think it's kind of fun to fun to learn about, you know. Yeah. Who, who yeah. was your first? Uh, did you have like a drum teacher through the years or? Um, I did eventually. I didn't um, have one when I lived in Ohio. I was just kind of hitting the drums and whatever. Um, when we moved to Connecticut, um, <clears throat> I wanted to study, but, you know, I was still a child. I was 11. And <laughs> I saw some drummers who I didn't want to emulate. And so I thought, I can't study from that person because I don't want to sound like that. I want to sound like this person on this record. You know? uh, but that was my childish immaturity because of course you can learn from anyone and, and those drummers knew way more than I did. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> and 
especially, you know, I was 11, I didn't know. Yeah. Um, but, but then I, you know, I was talking to one of my band leaders at school and he was saying, you know, just check out a teacher if you find one that, you, you know, you can, you feel that you can work with. And my mom found a teacher for me. Hmm. Um, so I started taking some lessons and, and that was really good. And I, so I had really in high school, I had two teachers. Uh, one kind of was junior high school. And then when I got to high school, I had another uh, drum, like private drum instructor. Yeah. Um, I also, you know, I mean, I was involved in all the bands at my schools, you know, <laughs> at the junior high school and at the high school. So <clears throat> stage band, concert band, marching <laughs> band, orchestra pit band, you know, um, I did all that stuff. And I also joined a fife and drum corps in a neighboring city. Mm, wow. Um, Forestville Fife and Drum Corps. So I, I joined that drum corps and, and I stayed with them, you know, probably for a whole summer. Mm. Um, I was told that the marches and I was so skinny. I was like that little, little thing. <laughs> and I was told that the marches were not going to be more than two and a half miles. And th the concern of mine was that my leg, um, because of the um, uh, brace, the harness mm -hmm. that you put on it and the brace that goes on the leg when you have the drums, uh, the marching drums. Um, oh it, yeah, yeah. It kind of bumps against your leg when you're walking, so it was bruising me. It would cause a, cause a bruise, and um, I thought, okay, two miles, two and a half miles, I can I can take, but but no longer than that. And they did one that was like a five mile march, <laughs> and they didn't tell us prior, and I was like, that's it. <laughs> So that was my last uh, oh, okay. Fife and Drum Corps <laughs> deal, you know. Yeah. Where did you <laughs> but it practice? Was great because uh, hmm? uh, I was wondering where were you practice, like in the house or? In the like, house, did you have yeah, a kid? Yeah. Okay, so the parents yeah, were I cool with them. <laughs> Not really, but they were. I, I practiced at first. I set up in the living room, and then they made me put the drums in the basement. So the basements <laughs> wherever we lived always became my areas. Um, when I got to high school, I was finally able to put the drums up in my bedroom. Mm -hmm. um, so then I practiced up there and, and I would do it, you know, during the day when, when my parents were working, you know, before they got home. <laughs> gotcha. um, and then in high school too, I used to skip a lot of classes and go home and play drums. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. My drum so I had kit, a house to myself. Yeah. <laughs> my drum kit was in my parents' room, believe it or not. Oh, no. And I had a cowbell and they still let it happen. They had, like a, <laughs> they had a side spare area. So I always thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> nice parents. <laughs> yeah. But then I came home one day a few years ago, my dad sold my kit. So I was kind of pissed about that. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so one day I'll get another one. Yeah. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, you mentioned going to Berkeley School of Music, um, but you left early, right? You didn't graduate? Correct. But saying that you went there, that kind of take, does that kind of open up a lot of doors in the music world? I think in some circles, in okay. some circles, not, I mean, some oh. people don't care, you know, mm -hmm. but I think in some circles it does just because it lets people know that you have studied um, and that you are a serious musician, but you know, most people just take you for face value, you mm -hmm. know, um, Carlos could care less whether you went to school or not, you know, oh, okay. he cares about what happens on the bandstand mm -hmm. as most people do. Lenny Kravitz could, care less probably about whether you went to school or not you know just what happens on the bandstand are we communicating is this grooving you know and 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 that's really the important part but you know i i, I think it's also for, for myself and and for where i want to be as a musician i think that the study is also very important you know because it takes you out of your own comfort zone and you start to think of things that other people think of that you may not have thought of or look mm. at things in a way that you may not have thought of. look at this chord in this way instead of the way that you look at it mm -hmm. you know um so i think that it's it's also important uh depending on what kind of musician you want to be you know where you want your music to go your musicianship to go mm -hmm. you know um but like i said in a lot of circles it just doesn't really matter okay well you mentioned getting to <laughs> new york um I was wondering, how do you kind of, it seems like you befriended some of your musical heroes and got to know a lot of people that way. Um, did you get any resistance to that? Or like, how do you work that angle? 
of getting to know people. Yeah. Like I was just wondering, like when people are more established and maybe you're trying to break into the scene and make connections, were they inviting or did they kind of make it rough on you at first? Or how did you kind of get into that, into the scene? Well, I didn't, I, I'll say this to start. I didn't look at it as any kind of angle. Uh, I was just there for the love of the music, you know, and I was my wanting to meet people um, was just my love and respect for them. There was no angle to that, oh, okay. you know, um, yeah. so I wasn't trying to position myself for anything other than mm. the joy of meeting mm. one of my heroes or meeting mm -hmm. a person I respect or hearing the music that somebody's doing, you know, mm. so um, I'll, I'll say that to start, you know, um, but I was very lucky for the most part because like meeting elvin jones was classic he was so open to not only me mm. but to all the young musicians you know he was just very warm and friendly and he made you feel uh like you were a part of the scene and and very welcomed that you're there that you're in new york that you're playing you know, and Art Blakey was like that. I mean, he became like my dad. I, <laughs> we got to be very close, um, like father and daughter. Mm -hmm. And I babysat for his children. He had two small children at the time. And so I became the babysitter. That's how close we became. <laughs> I became the babysitter for those children. And so I got to be at his house almost every day, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so we became quite close, me and his family, and of course his wife and, and, and the two little boys, um, Akira and Kenji. Um, and I became close with the rest of his family as a result of all that too, you know, his older children. Um, and, you know, most of the cats were very warm. Some of the musicians, um, were not, were not warm. Mm. You know, there's one in particular, uh, that I won't mention the name of, but <laughs> I went down to see this particular drummer <laughs> playing, uh, at the Vanguard and I'm just trying to think of how I can say this without divulging the name because I'm not trying to yeah. out anybody. Oh yeah. Um, he had a, a drum that I wanted to see, let's mm. put it that way, a particular snare drum. And so I I went and I, I sat down on in the Vanguard on drummer's row, which is kind of the benches on the side of where the drums are. They call that drummer's row. And I watched, I was listening to the music, and afterwards I I introduced myself and you know, I I I asked him about the snare drum and and the, and he said well you're a drummer and I said yeah and he said well you're not supposed to be playing drums you're, you're a girl mm. I was like huh what and at this time I was you know babysitting for Art Blakey uh, in that period you know that was through in that initial period and so the next day when I went to watch his children I told him what happened and he said oh Cindy you can always tell somebody's level by the way they act or by the way they treat you he said that's why that MF doesn't play any better than he does. <laughs> <laughs> so not everybody was, you know, all, you know, peaches and cream, but mm -hmm. most people were because, oh, you know, the people, the people that to me, the people that really cherish and love the music the most, they want to see young people come mm -hmm. because that is the, the new breed of the music. Mm -hmm. And those are the people who are going to push the music and carry the music forward, you know, in the future. Yeah. So for me, I love the young cats because they're the ones who, who are going to be keeping this music alive, yeah. you know, so I try to welcome them with as much warmth as possible whenever I'm around them. Because um, I know what that's like, A, to be in that position. Um, and I also know, B, what the music needs, which is fresh blood. It needs people who love the music and cherish the music and who want to push the music forward. Mm. No, that's great to hear. And you know, you talk about Art Blakey being an influence and I know Tony Williams as well. Like what was something about his style that um, maybe appealed to you? Because it's funny, I, like when I see clips of them and hear their style, I, I might not be able to pinpoint anything specifically, but I feel like I can see the influence they had on you. And then I also look at rock and roll and I could see or I can hear like John Bonham and you, Mitch Mitchell. So I think you have such a well-rounded base. And uh, kind of a long question, but then I just wanted to ask, like, what uh, about Tony Williams maybe drew you to his style? Oh, thank you. I, you know, and, and I'm going to preface this by saying that there were, Tony's my biggest influence and my biggest hero. He's my absolute favorite drummer, you mm. know, but there were a lot of other drummers in New York who 
I loved and who were also very kind to me and who helped me. Al Foster was a great friend of mine. You know, we talked on the phone all the time. I'd go see him play as much as I could. Uh, Billy Hart, uh, Lewis Hayes, Billy Higgins, Ed Blackwell, uh, Jimmy Cobb. It's like another uncle or dad, Roy Haynes, mm. Philly Joe Jones, of course, Elvin and Art Blakey, Max Roach, you know, oh, I, yeah. who I, I adored and, and got to to talk to and befriend as well. Kenny Clark, who I met, um, he saw me sit in. Um, Papa Joe Jones, who I got to see and meet, you know, um, and others too. But, you know, this is like the core of what has developed me but also what has developed my hero tony williams because mm. he was a very studied musician a very studied drummer and um all those people plus more you know all the chick webs and sid catlin and baby dodd and denzel best and all these other drummers um you know he, he loved as well and learned from so tony to me encompasses the entire history of the drums the entire present of the drums and the entire future of the mm. drums. Everything about his playing, I loved. He was a sound innovator. So before he even played anything, you know, when he would tap a drum, the way that he tuned the drum and with his touch, it just sounded beautiful. You know, um, his touch on the ride symbol, I could just isolate oh, everything yeah. and just listen to his ride mm -hmm. for the rest of my life and be totally happy with that. <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, the way that he played his snare drum, the way he feathered the bass drum, you know, the way that he played the sock cymbal or didn't, you know, sometimes he would leave it out, sometimes he would play it. Um, just all those choices, the way that he encompassed the whole uh, drum set into um, the groove, the feel of the timekeeping, you know, it just was this whole wall of sound that was like a whole African troupe of drummers mm. rolled up into one guy, you know? Um, and then his technique, <laughs> it's like the most incredible thing I've ever seen. You know, I was hanging with a bunch of friends of mine when I was, when I was young, this is before I had seen Tony play, but I had heard him and I, I was already <laughs> in awe of him just by hearing the, the records that I heard. And my friends invited me to go see the the new star wars movie that was out and i went because i'm a sci-fi buff i love sci-fi okay and before i went though uh i heard about this um drum clinic that tony was doing and i begged my mom i'm like i have to go <laughs> this is so i have been talking about this i said this is the drummer i've been telling you about i have to go see him and so she acquiesced and and got me some tickets and i know oh, it was cool. hard she was a single mom you know raising her children and you know, it's difficult, but she did it. I, I, I thank my mom to this day, you know, especially even just for that one thing. And she did so mm -hmm. many, but just that one thing, because it set me on such a course, you know. And so I got to go see Tony play in this drum clinic. Wow. And I'm going to tell you, I was completely in awe. You know, again, <laughs> his his sound, his his just to watch his technique around the drum kit and his touch, his whole approach to drumming, his attitude behind the kit, you know, um, his fearlessness, just his whole, you know, unashamed approach to attacking the drums, being sensitive on the drums, you know, um, all of the emotions that go into playing the drums, um, whether it's sadness, joy, you know, um, romance or whatever, he put all of that into the drums. And so mm -hmm. Tony is, is to me, the most complete um, drummer I've ever heard. Mm. Uh, and my certainly my favorite. Um, yeah, so all of those things about Tony <laughs> are what I love. And then, wow. you know, he innovated so many different styles. You know, if you look at all the innovations that he did conceptually from before he got with Miles, mm. you know, playing with, with Sam Rivers and, and, and different people like that and, and all the guys on the avant-garde scene, Gratian Moncour and, you know, even uh, Kenny Durham and, and different people, you know, and then you look at what he did when he was with Miles. And then you look at what he did just after Miles starting Lifetime, which influenced Miles, mm. you know, Miles, that was probably one third of the reason that Miles got his electric band and, and did um, In Silent Way and Bitches Brew and all of that. Uh, you know, Tony was was a big part of of that. 
um, in fact, Miles wanted Tony's band to be his band. <laughs> and of course that didn't work out, those yeah. egos clashed, you know, but you know, he, he innovated so many things. Um, so I have just total love and respect for, for what that person did mm. on the drums and in music. Wow. No, that's a great, uh, great story and examples. Um, and it makes me think too, uh, when you talk about all the greats like that, um, I hear there's a rumor about a Miles Davis iPod. <laughs> Where'd you hear that? <laughs> Jack Daly. He told me to ask you. <laughs> Jack is so yeah. funny. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Carlos makes these iPods and he, and he puts, he's, <laughs> he's, he's incredible because he likes to, to, um, file things and categorize and, and make names for certain things. Like he'll, he'll make a name. Um, I don't know. I don't remember some of the names, but let's say he's going <laughs> to call one um, explosive miles and then he'll make a whole oh, okay. um, a, like a filing. list of songs. He'll follow that and it'll be the explosive miles or morning miles, the afternoon miles, evening <laughs> miles, you know, and anyway, he's got tons of everything and he's been collecting for a long time wow. you know, and we still try to collect in case there's something that we haven't seen and everything <laughs> goes on that ipod so wow. <laughs> i love that jack told you about that but yeah, yeah. it's um it's incredible <laughs> it's like our bible mm. we don't neither one of us go anywhere without that that ipod <laughs> it's got to have some serious storage on it <laughs> yeah yeah and we have to keep updating you know because there's so much uh uh music that we yeah have. so we keep updating and and, and keep getting bigger <laughs> bigger iPods that have more memory and you know we put we just keep adding yeah well that's funny and you know you talk about all the people you admired growing up what's it like do you ever think about being one of the biggest influences to female drummers over the last 30 years that's got to be pretty pretty neat to to think about I actually don't think about it if, okay. if that's the case then I'm, I'm really happy about that because I just I feel that if there's somebody who wants to play drums, whatever their, their gender is, they should be able to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, they should be able to express that. And we should accept that because, you know, every person um, has a different energy to offer and yeah. a beautiful energy to offer. So, you know, I think it's like a, a flower garden. You know, you have all these different colors, all these different varieties, and they all make up this beautiful scene to look at, you know. So if that's the case, I'm, I'm, I'm really honored mm -hmm. about that, you know, but I'm not thinking about that, you know, I'm thinking about furthering uh, the drums, furthering myself mm -hmm. as a drummer, and then furthering the drums, you know, what can I do to um, reinvent this thing that Tony played or reinvent this thing that Art Blakey played in a way that Philly, Max, Tony, Elvin, Roy, you know, or any of those guys didn't. Mm -hmm. Is there a way, you know, maybe <laughs> not because all those guys did you know, take art stuff and turn it around. They all took Philly stuff and turn it around. They took Elvin stuff and turn it around and did different things, you know, but that's what I go for. Mm. You know, um, uh, if I'm listening to other drummers, you know, like Mitch Mitchell or, 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 or John Bonham or the drummers with, with uh, Clyde and Jabba with James Brown, you know, how can I turn this thing around and, and play it a little differently? Mm. Um, so the reinvention of something is is very important to me because it helps you grow and it helps the music grow. Uh, so that's what I that's what I look to do. Well, what what is it about Gretsch drums that are so special for you compared to like Pearl Ludwig? You know, uh, I had a sonar kit. Like, what sticks out for you to play in for so many years? Um, Gretsch to me uh, has a sound that is very pleasing to the ear because. It's round, it's warm, it's projecting, um, but it also holds a note very well. Mm. Like a lot of the newer drums, they're, they have a lot of sub and a lot of um, deep tones and they're loud, they're very loud drums. Some of them are louder than Gretsch drums, but they don't have a pretty note. You know, the note is not as tunable as a Gretsch drum. Gretsch has a lot of mid, so it allows a note to speak. If it's too subby, if the drum is too subby, if it has too many subtones, then it's going to sound more muddy and thuddy, mm. you know. And I like a distinction because, like a piano, so I like to hear my notes uh, so that I can make different melodies, you know, whatever scale I choose or whatever um, variation or intervalic uh, differences I choose between the notes, whatever that is, and it could change daily. But whatever mm. that is, you know, whether it's 
pitch related or whether it's specific note related, I want to hear distinction in my drums, you know, and with a lot of other drums, you, you, you can't hear that, you know, and so for me, um, there's that aspect of Gretsch. And then there's the aspect that the history is so deep with Gretsch that that sound has built my favorite music, mm. you know, that's the sound that Art Blakey had in his most innovative period. Max, um, uh, in his most innovative period to me, play, you know, played Gretsch. Um, all the drummers except Roy Haynes and Buddy Rich, mm. you know, they they didn't play Gretsch, but everybody else did. Mm. Even Mitch Mitchell had a Gretsch kit. Even John Bonham had a Gretsch kit, and John Bonham was a Ludwig guy, and you know, obviously got an incredible sound out of out of that. But even he had a Gretsch kit, mm. you know. Um, so it's the history of of that drum to me is is really um, undeniable, you know, because it sounds so musical. And I think Lenny likes Gretsch too, doesn't he? He, do, he does, yeah. <clears throat> and he likes he likes Ludwig. He's okay. a Ludwig guy, you know. But but he loves Gretsch. He he loved my Gretsch drums, mm. you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank goodness, yeah, he yeah, yeah. Drums. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did. And I I played Sonar too. I played Sonar for quite oh, a while. Oh, okay. Um, and Sonar made a great product. You know, they had incredible quality control. Mm. Um, <clears throat> And the drums project really, really well. Yeah. But I wasn't getting as much of a note, a sweet note, as what I wanted. Mm -hmm. you know? So Gretsch gives me more of that. But but Sonar makes an excellent product as well. They have excellent drums. I you know I still have uh, my uh, Babinga kit that I have, okay that I got. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was it like uh, finally, kind of? Tr going over to the rock and roll world, right? Because I heard you hadn't really listened to Lenny at all, uh, maybe didn't really know who he was. And then I know you played uh, for him through the phone. And my first thought was, man, that must have been a really good phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really good phone. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know who Lenny was. You know, um, I liked the fact that, you know, our mutual friend Antoine, saxophone player, um, told me that this is a, a rock and roller guy who likes Gretsch drums and Kazojin cymbals and Miles and Coltrane. And I'm like, oh, he's got ears. I want to meet him. That sounds really cool, you know. Um, so from that aspect, we just we hit it off great because we we liked so much of the same stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and we liked enough different stuff that you know I could bring some things to the table, and he brought things to the table that I hadn't been exposed to that I fell in love with, you know. So it was really you know, I think um, a great uh, period and a great, not only sharing, but it just became a great energy on stage, especially once we really learned each other, you know, and I learned his language, I learned how to communicate with him and, you know, what he wanted in his music and how to really make that come off, but still be Cindy, you know, um, and then we just started to sail and it was just, that band was incredible jack yeah. was in that band of course um and it was the best version of that band in my opinion yeah. that i've ever heard was um with jack on bass jack daly on bass craig ross of course on guitar lenny of course um George harold Lacks todd <laughs> harold todd on, yeah. on on saxophone michael hunter on trumpet <clears throat> oh, yeah. um and myself on drums that that band was just crazy good it was so mm -hmm. tight you know, it was so funky. We could just go anywhere. You know, yeah. we could play rock stuff. We could play. You know, if Lenny wanted us to to swing or walk or you know, we could do that because Jack's got a great feel on that bass. Mm -hmm. You know, so we could we could do that. You know, we could we could do whatever we wanted, and it and it was so tight. We we logged in thousands, I mean thousands of playing hours together. You know, with rehearsals and tours and everything. Yeah. So we were tight. Yeah. You know who I think Craig Ross is maybe the most underrated guitar player in the world i just don't understand why he's not even more big i think he's the best kept almost like a kept secret among the casual listener you know <laughs> yeah he's amazing you know it, it's um yeah that's a kind of a conundrum while he's not yeah. why he's not bigger than he is mm -hmm. you know um maybe part of it has to do with one of the beautiful things about his personality Mm -hmm. which is that he's so very soft-spoken yeah you know he's not gonna be in your face all loud and you know <laughs> crazy craig is just a very he's a gentleman 
you know, and he's a very sweet person. Um, and he knows how to be uh, an incredible side man. You know, I, I, I learned quite a few things from Craig about being a great side man, because as, as great as he is on his own, you know, he is a beautiful side man because he gives the music what it needs, mm. you know? So if it doesn't need him to show everything that he can do in five seconds, he's not gonna do that. And then sometimes people don't read that as well as they should. They, you know, sometimes, you know, they say that if, if somebody's soft, they take that for weakness. Yeah. It's not weakness, it's really strength. Mm -hmm. You can support that much, you know, and not uh, be overbearing, you know, or something like that. If that's, yeah. I want a better word, but he's very humble. He's very humble. So if you yeah. can do that and, and yeah, be, be humble and, and, and serve the music, you know, a lot of people can't do that, you know, but he yeah. does that very, very well. And um, I remember one time there was one song where Lenny wanted me to just play sock symbol. And I was like, sock symbol? <laughs> you just want me to play sock symbol? I don't want to just play sock symbol, you know? And, and Craig was like, you know what, Cindy? He said, yeah, you know, one time Lenny asked me to play, it's like just one note. And I was like, really? He said, and, and I, I played this one note. He said, but I played that one note as best I could. He said, now, man, I can play one note great. <laughs> <laughs> So I was like, yeah, okay. So I, you know, I took that and uh, mm. I played that sock symbol part as good as I could, you know. <laughs> um, and and to me, that's the that's the beauty of of really not only a great musician but a, a great person. Mm. You know, yeah. when you can when you can express that and do that and be what the situation needs, you know. Yeah. No, he's a great guy and uh, doesn't forget anybody either. He's, he's, he's the coolest and uh, hoping to get Craig on one day. Then I can complete the big trio, you know, the band, but yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, get him for sure. It'll be a wonderful, yeah. wonderful interview. And then you got, you got to get the three of us on there. You get some. Oh, that'd be, yeah. We'll get, we'll get a little, <laughs> uh, a little group chat going on, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, what was it like to having uh, Jack Daly when he auditioned with 250 other bassists in LA? Do you have any memories of that or? Oh my goodness. Yeah. We were, you know, we, the bass player that, you know, was initially in the band when I joined Tony Bright, mm, yeah. um, we, we had to get another bass player because Tony kind of just disappeared. Mm -hmm. And so we had gigs coming up, you know, <laughs> we had the MTV awards and then we had a tour right after that, you know, a big tour right after that. So they brought in all these bass players. I mean, the first day we auditioned 90 bass players. And so I played, are you going to go my way 90 times in one day? <laughs> <laughs> and they all play, I think they all played three songs. They all played, are you going to go my way of blues and then something of their choice. Oh, okay. You know? um, and so I played you know, three times 90 is what I played all day with those cats. And I was trying to really lay it down for each one because I wanted to be fair. Mm -hmm. And I want to really give each one a fair shot at, you know, being the bass player or getting a shot at being a bass player. Yeah. So that was the first day. And then the next day we did probably, I don't know, you know, close to another 90, maybe another 80 or whatever. We kept, you know, auditioning these bass players. <laughs> and finally, it boiled down to these two who came from, from New York. And Jack was one of those two. Mm. And... Um, when Jack played, I was like, oh, that's, that's got to be the guy. And, and so Lenny went up and played with him and, and Craig's um, first wife and I were sitting down on the couch watching and we were like, yeah. And when Lenny came back, she said, Lenny, that's the guy. And I was like, yeah, that's the guy, man. We, he sounds great. Cause he sounded great with me. He sounded great with Lenny. You know, he just had a great feel. He had a great mm -hmm. attitude. He was just the right guy. You could tell he was the one. And so Jack got the gig, you know. <laughs> um, he had a lot, a lot of music to learn for that tour. So yeah, for the MTV Awards, Lenny called John Paul Jones, which was incredible because then I got to play with John Paul Jones. Yeah. You know, that was amazing. <laughs> um, so John Paul did the MTV Awards that year. Um, and then Jack was learning all the music and he did the tour. 
Mm. And he learned it really fast, but he was really, he had so much to learn that I think he was up all the time, you know, learning all the parts, because you have to learn every part, you know, mm. for, for Lenny's thing, you got to learn all the parts. And he was learning all the parts and then he would fall asleep. And so what we saw of Jack was him sleeping. <laughs> like, whoa, this guy's really nice, but he doesn't do anything except sleep. <laughs> That's all he does is sleep. But it was really because he was up all, all night, you know, learning the music like he should have. Yeah. And he just really solidified what was going on. And he really mm. made the unit so tight. And like I said, he was also the right person. Because when you're traveling a lot and you're, we were doing bus tours. So when you're, um, spending that much time with people, you have to be able to travel with them, yeah. you know, or else something's going to go awry. And mm -hmm. so Jack was like the perfect fit for everything, for the band, for the bus, you know, just as a buddy, you know, he was like the perfect brother, you know, the perfect fit for, for all mm -hmm. of them. Yeah. Well, that's all great too. And he's got great hair too. You got the hair, him, yeah, great hair. Yeah. Craig and Lenny. So. <laughs> <laughs> and even George Lax, he's got good hair too. He does. He has a really cool <laughs> set of head of hair. <laughs> yeah. What do you think about Lenny now having the dreads? It's like a throwback look, you know? I love the dreads. I think his yeah. dreads are amazing. You know, I mm -hmm. mean, I, I loved Bob Marley's look, you know, and his dreads are thick, like, yeah. like, like Marley's, you know, I, I like it. I think it's very yeah. um, natural looking and it's, it's very um, earthy, yeah. you know, and, and, and it suits him because his energy is like that, mm -hmm. you know. Very bohemian, you know? <laughs> yeah, very much so. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to tell you, I won a contest in 2008. I was right out of high school and I got to go on tour with Lenny for the Love Revolution tour. Mm -hmm. And I was so excited um to me and my dad we got to hop on a bus and in each city we'd pick an, up a new person so we got to go out to dinner a few times with lenny go on the bus and i was so bummed that you weren't in the band at the time and uh, we got franklin <laughs> vanderbilt uh 2008 yeah i was not there yeah i was yeah. i was last there in 2007 yeah yeah then we got franklin vanderbilt so i learned about him and i love him now but it was so cool to get some of that behind the scenes kind of interaction with my favorite people um and it was great then to see you in like 2014 and 15 you rejoined the band and yes. i was wondering how did that happen and was that kind of like a last go round or what how did that all happen it, it was great like to a see last you. go around or anything okay. like that it was you know they called me and they said oh. you know <clears throat> lenny misses you and he wants to know if you <laughs> want to come back and um i was like yeah you know i miss playing in the band this is really you know would be great and I, so his manager invited me over to uh, hear the new record uh, that was out at the time. And he said, you know, can you see yourself playing this music? And I was like, yeah, yeah. I like it. <laughs> you know, so then it just happened, you know, it was because they wanted me to come back and I, I wanted to come back. So we, mm -hmm. we did it and it was really, really cool. Yeah, yeah I have a great, I have a great memory because I saw you guys uh, in, at the Greek theater in LA and mm -hmm. I was right in the front. And after the show, it was a really good show. And you you came right to me and you're like, here, have this. And you gave me your stick. And See it's that? so cool. Yeah. <laughs> so it has a bunch of wear on it, which I love. And uh, you, you pre-signed it. It said Cindy Blackman Santana. So it's in, I, I have a drum head signed by Lenny and it's in, it's in the shadow box with the drum head. So uh, awesome. I, I had to tell you that little, little tidbit. <laughs> I like it. I like yeah. it. And I also want to know my first time I ever got to see you guys was when you opened up for Aerosmith in like 2006. And I was mm -hmm. curious how that was because I got to tell Jack Daly, I still remember the lights were out. You guys open up with Where Are We Running? And I could yeah. see like the reflection off the guitars. And then I could mm -hmm. see the vibration of your kick drum opening up in that song. So that it's one of my favorite rock and roll memories. That was a fun tour because I I'm a huge Steven Tyler fan. Okay. He's such a cool front man. You know, the way he <laughs> sings and you know, it's yeah. just that was really a blast. Yeah, we had we had a, a, a fun tour. I I loved that tour. That was really fun. Yeah. You know, that was a, that's one of my favorite memories. And I was also wondering too, I remember on YouTube some stuff popped up. I think it was in Paris, and it was when you had rejoined Lenny. And then I, I think Carlos Santana came out and jammed with you guys or it was yeah. somewhere in Europe. And I was wondering, how, was that all, were you guys dating at the time or you were already married? So is that- We were married. We were married yeah. at the time and, and it was the end of the tour. Um, so he came out um, just at the, at the very end and, and uh, he came to the, 
to the show. I actually didn't even know he came to the concert. I thought he was in the hotel room. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> really? <laughs> and then he was on the side of the stage, and I guess Alex. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, the guitar uh, tech. Uh, Lenny, Lenny's guitar, uh, guitar tech offered yeah. him a guitar, and he just came out and started playing. And I was like, oh, okay, this is cool. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, I just remember that little tidbit and was, and was curious the story behind it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Well, uh, I know you're a fan. You mentioned him, I think, Clyde Stubblefield, right, from uh, James Brown. So mm -hmm. I always have loved that clip, too. It must have been pretty surreal for you to then play with Lenny and had James Brown on stage, right? I think it was for some award show. Um, yes, fashion, sh fashion show awards. And you yeah. played with James Brown uh, or James Brown played with us or however you want to <laughs> look at it. You know, maybe we played yeah. with James Brown. <laughs> That's probably the better way to look at it. Um, but yeah, that was so cool. It was so funky. You know, I, I, I mean, huge James Brown fan. How can it not be? Yeah. Um, we all are. You yeah. know, so that was like a highlight for us to, to play with him. And, and it was funny because after we played, um, James's manager came over to me and he said, um, uh, Mr. Brown is interested in you joining his organization. <laughs> You know, wow. uh, what, what would it take to, to get you to, to join up with Mr. Brown, you know, to come over here? And I said, well, you know, I, I, I love playing with Lenny and, I, and I'm committed to this band and I make this much money. He went, oh, that's no. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Oh, that's good. <laughs> oh, it was so funny. I cracked up, you know, but yeah, we had a great time. And there was another time where my band opened up for, for James Brown and this is the the very first time I think I met him in um, Lebanon. Mm. And um, uh, it was really cool. It was for a private wedding. And <laughs> there had been a travel ban on Americans going to Lebanon because there had just been like some bombings and different stuff. Mm. And they just opened up the band, so the travel ban. So we were like the first people to go over there uh, since the ban had been lifted. Wow. Um, and we were in the we were in the airport and I was in the lounge and I saw James sitting, he and his wife were kind of sitting in the corner and I wanted to go to go say hi to him. And um, I, I walked over and I, you know, he stood up because he, he knew I was coming to them because, you know, they were the only two people over there. <laughs> <laughs> so he stood up and I introduced myself and, you know, I, I said that I, I played with Lenny Kravitz and, you know, whatever. And he says, yeah, but what else do you do? And I was like, hmm? What do you mean? What else? I didn't know what he meant. Yeah. He says, you do something else. I know you play with Lenny, but what else do you do? And I said, well, I'm a jazz musician. I'm a jazz drummer. I played with so-and-so. He said, I know. That's what I'm talking about. I can tell. And I said, well, how do you know? He said, I can tell by the way you walk. <laughs> <laughs> He's a character. Yeah. And then on the way back, um, Tracy Wormworth was playing bass with, with, with me at the time. Mm. And we were sitting in our seats and, and we were in business class. James was up in front. And we were like, <laughs> Yeah, we should go talk to him you know so we went up to say something to him and we had instruments that we wanted him to sign she had her mm -hmm. bass and i had a cymbal you know so i i took took my bass she took her cymbal and i and and we had some sharpies and we asked him if he would sign and on mine he signed it and i of course still have it I've, oh I'll nice save it forever yeah. he wrote to cindy the female king you're too awesome mm -hmm. to be queen <laughs> oh that's pretty good <laughs> james brown <laughs> <laughs> that's great <laughs> yeah it's a special memory yeah well you, you know speaking about the greats like him uh, i heard that herbie hancock and uh, wayne shorter played at your wedding right so uh, how did that all feel <laughs> that must have been pretty surreal oh, that was yeah i get sentimental about that because mm. they are so special to me both of them because i i learn not have learned but have learned and do learn so much from listening to them and get so much inspiration you know for playing for writing you mm. know for everything just you know as beings on this planet they're they're both incredible people um and you know we were carlos and i were planning our wedding and he said um if you could choose anybody on this planet to play for our wedding who would it be mm. and i said oh, herbie and wayne <laughs> and he went <laughs> Really? And I said, you asked. <laughs> you asked me. If you want to go somewhere else now, we can go somewhere else. But you asked me who I would choose if, you know, if I could get anybody. And that's who I would choose. And so um, he worked on, I guess he, wow. he made some calls and talked to them. Yeah. And, and fortunately, 
they agreed, you know, and they came and did it. And it was just so beautiful. Wow. Uh, so heartwarming and just, you know, just so touching just with the two of them. Mm -hmm. Because the way that they play together, the way they react together, and they know each other so well, just wherever they go, you know, it's just beautiful. Yeah. He he made it happen. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, he did. Well, I've always wondered, you know, like, what was your guys' first date, you and Carlos? Like, what'd you do? First date? What did we do on the first? I think probably the first date was playing a gig together. Oh, okay. Although we didn't know it at the time that that was the first date. Yeah. But I think the first official date was um, going out to, to dinner. You know, mm. Carlos loves, loves, loves to dine out. You know, okay. and he had some uh, favorite restaurant that he wanted to take me to, one of his that he, that he really loved. Um, loves still, actually. So we went there. Is it in the Bay Area? In, yeah. And oh, I was okay. living in New York at the time and came um, to, the, to the Bay Area to, to visit with him. And so we went out to this delicious restaurant and, and you know had a lovely evening yeah and then the rest was history like the, the chemistry was there right from the start or chemistry was there you know I subbed for Dennis Chambers um mm. when Carlos had a gig that wasn't on the tour schedule mm. um just something popped up I think a corporate gig popped up that he wanted to do and he needed to sub so he called they called me to to do the gig and I did it and um we like we started talking, um, like they invited me to Las Vegas to see the band because there's so many changes and so many hits and you know there's so much going on. They just wanted me to see the flow of what was mm-hmm. going on and to sit in and get an idea of what was happening. So I did that, and um, then the gig was like a few weeks later. Um, but in that interim. We started, you know, I, I texted him about the music and I had some questions. So I texted him a couple of questions that I had. Um, and then we started talking about all this stuff spiritually. You know, we started having these deep spiritual conversations. So the vibe was growing from then, you know. Um, and I was really intrigued with that because I, I had really stopped dating at that point um, by choice because I hadn't been dating at that particular time I hadn't had a a guy in my life who was on a spiritual path you know and I missed that I Mm -hmm. missed having that and I needed that because of where I'm at and was at at the time and and wanted to grow and so when we were starting to have all these conversations about spirit and where he was and where I was and you know talking about it was just really mind-boggling I, I i loved it I, I i you know was just totally intrigued so the the vibe was was growing you know mm. right from that start awesome. <laughs> well it made me wonder like do you guys ever get in arguments because like touring is do you kind of have to drop what's going on to look happy on stage like i'm just wondering how that dynamic if you ever irritate with each other and then the show starts you just gotta throw it off to the side right <laughs> We have been irritated with each other for, you know, just a couple of times, but that's rare actually for us. It's really rare, okay. uh, which, you know, is, we're fortunate that we have that. But the way that I look at the bandstand and the way that he looks at the bandstand is pretty much the same. It's like your, your prayer station, mm-hmm. you know, so no matter what, I don't bring stuff to the bandstand whether it's with my husband or whether it's with somebody else. If I'm going to that bandstand, I'm going committed and I'm going to do my best and I'm going to bring as much love and joy um, to that music and to spread to people who are not only playing it with me, but who are listening. You know, Mm -hmm. I want to bring all that to the audience. I want the music to um, give the energy that it's supposed to give Mm -hmm. and have and feel like and be, you know, so I I clear my mind of no matter who I'm playing with, you know, and and especially with my husband, because we're so close, we see each other every day. (laughs) Yeah, but but we don't, we rarely argue. um, But what's good, no matter what, I just bring my best to the bandstand all the anytime, anytime. And and I, I can't do any less than that. Because when I play, it's like prayer. I look at it as praying. Mm. And I look at it as me being given a gift to be a channel to bring energy and light to people, you know? Mm. And so I can't destroy that for any other person or for myself. It's not worth it. And no situation is is worth destroying that God-given gift. Mm. No, it makes sense. And 
you know, one thing that makes me think though about Santana, it, it must be, is it kind of nice uh, jamming with him? Cause I know playing with Lenny, you guys have a lot of jams, but they're also very structured. So do you get a little bit more freedom with Carlos and playing with him or? Yeah, yeah, you do. And that's really cool because I'm a jazz musician. So I, I love, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, to explore. Mm. So we, we have more explorative uh, 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 sections in the music, you know, mm. which is really great. And I get to take drum solos, which I love because I love playing the drums, you know. So, yeah, it's very cool. <laughs> awesome. Well, I wanted you to talk a little bit about your band that you have. You're, you're playing some East Coast dates coming up, right? Yes, yes. Thank you for asking about that. We, we play um, starting uh, in New York, actually, in New York oh, City at the Cutting Room mm. um, on the 26th of October. And then we play... Uh, at a place called Jimmy's Jazz and Blues in New Hampshire mm. on the 27th. Okay. And then on the 28th, 29th, and 30th of October, we're in Baltimore at Keystone Corner. Awesome. And um, we have, um, on the first two shows, we have Aurelian Budnick on guitar, David Gilmore on guitar as well. Oh, wow. Uh, Felix Pastorius on the bass, Mark Carey on keyboards, Emilio Modesta on saxophone, and of course myself on drums. Um, and then for the Baltimore gigs, um, we'll have everyone except Aurelian. He's got another commitment, so mm -hmm. we won't have him on those those shows. But yeah, this is really great because we get to we get to explore. Yeah, you know, I want that from people. I want you know, of course, I want the groove, and I want it to feel great all the mm -hmm. time. And and we have to. Um, pay homage to the music that we're playing, you know, but I, I like uh, what I would call a controlled freedom. Mm. Um, so we pay reverence to the structure, but, you know, we can balloon it out and, and bring it back, you know, as yeah. long as we are on the structure, once you know the structure of a song, it's like if you know the rules, you can then break them. So if you know the structure <laughs> of the song, then you can go in and out of it and without back. losing that, mm. you know. Um, so that's what we do. And it's, it's cool. really fun. No, that sounds great. I'm going to uh, put a, some links in the bio and on uh, Twitter and stuff. So you can get the word out too. And Thank uh, you. Thank yeah, you. I just have a couple quick, quick, fun ones for you. That's okay. Um, okay. And you're probably more experienced at zoom than me. I'll cut this part out, but I, I put the meeting till uh, my time four fifteen. Do you know, does this thing just stop recording at that time or can you go? I don't think so. I think you can go a little. Okay. Later, I was just, I says, it still says recording. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to make sure it's not going to like cut you off if I ask you a question and it hits 415. I which... don't think it will. It okay. shouldn't. Because I am does, wrapping it up. I'm respectful does, of your can, time. We can, we can, you can ask me the questions another time. Or we okay, can, cool. You know, come back. Okay, sweet. I'll, I'll wrap it up. I just wanted to make sure I don't go a couple seconds over and then it cuts me off. Cool. Well, uh, that sounds great. We'll put the links out and then had a couple fun questions for you. Um, all the travels you've done, what's your... What has the what's what studio has the best sound for the drums to record in? Oh my goodness! Um, or is that too loaded of a question? <laughs> well, uh, not really. I, I, I've recorded in some incredible studios. Like I hmm. recorded in Rudy Van Gelder's studio in New York. Oh wow! And of course, that has like a classically beautiful sound, you know, because he did all the Blue Note records. Um, I recorded. Um, at uh, a studio in the Bay Area, I'm trying mm. to remember the name of it. It's a small studio, uh, Studio D. Okay. Which it's not a large studio, but the sound is awesome because it's got really high ceilings, and the room is kind of wide, so the drums mm. sound humongous <laughs> in there. Yeah, they sound incredible. Those are two of the studios that I I have liked um, probably some of the best in terms okay. of getting my my drum sounds and I've gotten good sounds even in a really small studio. Um, I did some for my last record. I recorded um, some in um, the Bay and some mm. in Las Vegas. In Las Vegas, I recorded at the Palms studio, which oh, yeah. is not existent anymore. Okay. And that had a great sound. My drum sounded beautiful in there. Um, and then we recorded all the vocal stuff, most of the vocal stuff in um, Nardo Michael Walden's studio, mm. which is a smaller room, smaller studio tighter sound but the drums had a really cool funky tight sound hmm, okay is studio d where is that in the bay area like berkeley or no no it's um i think it's in 
Sausalito. Oh, okay. Sausalito or San Rafael, somewhere around in there on that okay. Marin side. Nice. Yeah, it's in Marin. And then what's the biggest thing you've overcome during a show where maybe just seemed like everything's going wrong? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Biggest thing. Um, I know one show that we did um, with Carlos, um, we didn't have our sound gear, you know, because um, it was a festival and we were just coming in so quick. And the batch of sticks that I had, I don't know if I was playing too hard or if the batch <laughs> of sticks was just something, but every stick I hit was breaking. Like, <laughs> it would just crack in half in my hand. I'm looking at my tech. I'm like, what? Another one? <laughs> this is another one? And then my ears, the, the in-ears that I had, there was some sort of um, cable malfunction. Mm -hmm. And so the ears went out, you know, <laughs> and it was like, whoa, this, everything, the sticks are breaking, the ears are going out. <laughs> what else is going to happen? You know, yeah. so you just go with it and you just, you know, make the best of it and, and, and you know, stick breaks, you just grab another one. That breaks, you just <laughs> grab another one. Ears go out, just pull them out and yeah. go raw, you know, whatever you have to do. Yeah. <laughs> When I was playing in the church band, I was always hoping to break a stick, you know, I got to look like you got to look badass, you know. <laughs> What's the best part of making it? Uh, is it the fact that you don't have to set up your kid every night? <laughs> <laughs> if that's what making it is, that's that's yeah. a good that's a good one. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, I think making it is 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 subjective, mm -hmm. you know, because it means different things to different people. There's a certain amount of um, happiness that goes with the success of of being able to have a, a drum tech and a crew that helps you, you know, because that takes an incredible load off of you and that's a blessing so that's a that's a great thing, you know, um, not having to move your own drums is great because you save your back, you know, you save your, 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 <laughs> yeah. your, you save your stems for drumming that's what my doctor told me save your stems for drumming. <laughs> So there's all that, you know, but it's, it's subjective. Making it is subjective. I mean, you know, making it, those things are part of it, you know, mm -hmm. but making it also is for me, mm -hmm. um, my accomplishment on the drums, my accomplishment as a musician, my accomplishment as a sideman, my accomplishment as a leader, you know, am I a good band leader? Am I able to really convey what I want in the music without encroaching on people so that they're mm -hmm. free enough to be themselves in the music, but yet give it what I feel that it needs. And it's my band. So we're going to have that, you know, mm -hmm. but I want what they bring and I want the freedom and I want it. I want them to feel free to go different places with the music, you know, without having to check in with Cindy all the time, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's, that's part of all of those things are, are making it to me. Mm. Well, you've literally done it all. Uh, you met so many great people on the way. So when is the uh, Cindy Blackman movie coming out? <laughs> Cindy Blackman movie. I like that. I yeah. don't know. I hadn't thought about a Cindy Blackman movie, but you yeah. know, I have to work on that. Thank you for that, Ryan. I have to, yeah, oh, yeah. I have to, yeah. Another, you know, another box to check off, you know. Another box to check off. Yeah, I have to start thinking about that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> well, what else is on the agenda tonight? Uh, what's going on in your world? Tonight, you know, um, well, it's a little bit cloudy. This was supposed to be after this interview, this was going to be a beach day, but I'm oh, noticing okay. that it's a little cloudy. Um, <laughs> as long as it's not raining, I'm still going to the beach because oh, cool. even on a cloudy day, the beach here is just spectacular. Yeah. And otherwise, it's going to be a drumming kind of day. Oh, there we my go. My plan after this was to, I was playing drums this morning. So my plan is to, to for, the, for the afternoon after we're done is beach and drums. Okay. And if it's too rainy to go to the beach, it'll just be drums. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's my day. And okay. that's a good day for me. What are you working on today? Any like rudiment stuff or? Yes, very much so. Cause I've been, I took off about a week, you know, okay. <laughs> seven, eight days of rest. Uh, cause we were hitting it pretty hard. So now I'm just warming up, you know, I started warming up with my rudiments and warming mm. up things around the drums that I like to do. Um, awesome. yeah, just getting back into the field. So I'm ready and fired up to go, uh, next week when we start up. Awesome. Yeah. In Vegas, right? No. In New oh, York, sorry. This Vegas. is the East coast. Sorry. And then coast, November is Vegas. Vegas. Yeah. November is, is Vegas with, yeah. with, with Santana and that'll be the last Santana show of the year. Uh, we have two weeks there, uh, but first it's it's uh, awesome. my band on the East Coast, and then I'll uh, head back to uh, Las Vegas and, and and play the remaining eight shows of the year with uh, Santana. 
Awesome. Well, Cindy, uh, it means a lot to have you on. I'll probably celebrate by having you on by watching the documentary you're in, Count Me In. I saw that a Ooh. while ago. So I'll probably watch it again tonight. But uh, truly, I've admired you a lot of my life. Uh, you're my favorite drummer, and it meant a lot uh, to have you on. And I'll be you. sure to uh, send some snippets of this to my drum teacher because he'll get a kick out of it. I remember being in his garage, practicing and playing along to some Lenny tunes. So it's really cool oh, to awesome. have you on. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Tell your drum yeah. teacher I said hi. And, and I look forward to doing this again with, with uh, Craig and Jack. Yeah, we'll get the whole then, uh, crew on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then, then after that, we got to do one with myself and Carlos. Hey, that sounds good. Sounds like yeah. a plan. <laughs> yeah, we got, we, got some, we got some plans going. We got some oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, Cindy. Well, I'll let you get to the beach. I'll let you get to the drum set. Uh, thanks for coming on and uh, had a lot of fun talking to you. Me too, Ryan. This is great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.